Hey everybody, long time no see. I'm Brad, I'm the creator of Expanse, the volumetric sky, atmosphere, and clouds plugin for Unity's high definition render pipeline. And welcome to my apartment at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. <laughs> this is pretty much the only time I could find to make this video and actually sit down for an hour and, and, and get it all sorted out. Um, but the gist of it is that Expanse 1.5 should have released by the time that this video comes out. And, uh, and you know, if, if you're like most people, you'll probably upgrade from 1.4 and notice that a bunch of stuff is different. Um, and I want to make this video to highlight some of the cool new features that I think uh, are really interesting about 1.5 and, and hopefully it'll help you to navigate uh, the changes that have been made because um, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, but I hope that most of them either make things easier, make things more performant, or make things look better. Um, so yeah, let's just, let's just jump right in. So yeah, here we are in Unity. I think I'm using 2021.2. Yeah, 2021.2. Um, and uh, I just have this this uh, nature pack here. It's called Real Landscapes. It's really great. Um, and uh, and I have a, a simple expanse cloudless sky loaded in right now. Um, I can go over to the time of day controller and change the time of day to nighttime if I want to, whatever. Um, this is all familiar if you've used expanse before. And I've also got it set up. So I have my Xbox controller here. When I hit play, it'll load the scene and I can, you know, fly around with the camera um, that way uh, you know you guys can see everything running in real time I'll keep the stats up here I'll be running in v-sync mode so the frame rate will just lock to 60 FPS um, but yeah so I figure we'll go maybe from easy to complex or something so the first feature we'll talk about is gonna be something easy and then we'll go further and further into more and more complicated stuff and by the time we talk about the last feature maybe I'll talk about five or six of them it'll be something that's a little bit tougher to digest but hopefully will still be useful so the first one that I want to talk about is a pretty simple one it has to do with how expanse renders fog uh, it, you'll notice that if you, you know, take one of Expanse's uh, screen space height fog or screen space uniform atmosphere layers and you increase the density uh, and you have the physical lighting checkbox enabled, um, then you'll see that it, you know, darkens everything appropriately. Things look kind of blue and gray and it, it generally looks pretty good. Um, uh, the thing is that this physical lighting checkbox used to make things more expensive, um, and it, it still does. It's it's more expensive to use the algorithm that the physical lighting checkbox uses as opposed to just the other algorithm. Uh, but new in Expanse 1.5 is that the approximate algorithm that is more you know performant uh, looks pretty much exactly the same as physical lighting, and that's due to a new approximation. So this is with it off, and this is with it on, and they look exactly the same. Um, and so it's really easy now to uh, to just blanket your scene in, in volumetric fog that looks like it's path traced, but is really secretly under the hood, um, a lot more performant and efficient. Update number two has to do with how you create Expanse game objects. Uh, it used to be the case that you would have to go over to the game object hierarchy and click create empty, uh, and then go over to add component and add the script that you want. Um, but now, actually, uh, due to a little bit of editor work, uh, you can just right-click, and there's a menu called Expanse, and it has all the different components that you need uh, to to interact with Expanse. Um, so, for instance, if I want to create a, uh, a procedural cloud volume, I just go Expanse, Advanced Procedural Cloud Volume, and there we go. And that brings me into update number three, which is the Cloud Preset Browser. This is a new part of Expanse's UI, the procedural cloud volume, the cloud plane, the texture cloud plane. Um, all of these uh, now have this browser here that allows you to scroll through different presets so you can see what they look like and you can load them and, uh, and they'll load right into your scene. Um, you can also save your own presets. So let's say that I went to this one and I did some stuff to make it look a little bit different. Uh, and then I decided to save it. Um, I can go and I can position my camera however I want. And if I go back to the cloud volume, go to the preset browser and I hit um, save preset, I can save it. Uh, I can just call this test preset. I can hit save, and now if I refresh the preset library, 
which takes a second. Uh, and then scroll down, you can see test preset is here and it takes a screenshot of the currently rendering camera uh, and uses that as the image. So yeah, I can go back in, I can load that one and then I can load the test preset that we had before um, that we just saved out. Feature number four is one that people have been asking for for a while and I'm really excited to finally be able to say that Expands 1.5 has it and it's the ability to apply custom post-process effects to cloud layers in an arbitrary order, arbitrary number of them to make them look more stylized uh, and to help them better fit your artistic vision. Um, and it's very easy to get started with these. You pretty much go over to your cloud volume and you'll notice that there's a section labeled post-processing. If you open this up, you'll have a list of custom post-process passes and you can hit plus here and it'll give you um, a slot for an iCloud post-process pass. And this is uh, a C-sharp script that uh, you can write to do whatever you want. It will, uh, to, to the cloud frame buffer, it'll pass you the, the opacity, like the alpha frame buffer and the color frame buffer. You can do whatever you want to it and then it'll, uh, and then it'll, uh, it'll render it onto the screen. Um, but, not everybody wants to do that. Not everyone wants to implement their own. Hopefully we can crowdsource some of these, but to get people started, I've implemented a couple of examples. Um, one that's really simple is just a recolor pass. So this will recolor the clouds, whatever color you want. Uh, it can be useful for just sort of tinting them. Like if you wanted to tint the clouds, I don't know, maybe slightly yellow, uh, I think looks kind of cool or slightly orange. Um, and of course there's a rainbow mode. <laughs> I had to do that. Pride Month was a while ago, but you know, whatever. There's also a Kuwahara effect, which is a sort of simple painterly shader. Um, this looks like it's set a little bit aggressively, uh, but if we go here and sort of turn it down a little bit, then we can uh, we can see it working a little bit better. We might also want to go over here to self shadowing and disable shadow sample jitter, and now it looks a lot more stable. Um, so this is sort of a, the, the most basic, simple painterly effect. Um, you'll also notice that the cell shading parameters are gone from the procedural cloud volume, and this is because that's now implemented as a custom pass. Uh, so you can do cell, cell shading, um, and you can drag these to reorder the, the order that they get applied in. Um, so here, if we do cell shading again and come over here, we can control how smooth it is. We can say how many bands we want. Um, and then finally, uh, there is an alpha overlay pass. Um, and what I have right here is one set up just to use simple brush strokes. Um, you can say, you know, change a couple parameters, how much the overlay affects it, what the overlay gets clamped to. Um, and the end result, I think, is that you can create some pretty cool looking stylized clouds. Update number five is is kind of a small one, but it's a little bit technical, so I wanted to save it uh, for, for later in the video. Um, and that is the fact that all Expanse cloud presets are now serialized as Unity scriptable objects. Uh, this is something that Discord user Otter Otter and Aromatica Copy were sort of fighting vehemently for, and eventually they convinced me that it's the better thing to do. I think they're totally right. They know way more about Unity than I do, and, uh, and the decision I think was a really good one. Um, for reference, Expanse presets used to be saved as JSON files, and this was kind of good because they're portable and lightweight, uh, but now saving them as scriptable objects, they have first-class support as data containers in uh, in Unity, and uh, and I, you know we can be sure that they're going to be supported for many years to come. Um, so if you go into uh, the, the blocks folder, go to presets, um, and procedural cloud volume and, and select one of the presets, you can see that you can uh, edit it entirely in the editor here um, by just uh, scrolling through and, and looking at all the different settings. Um, and, uh, and this will also actually get written out to a YAML file if you decide to serialize your project to text, uh, which is a setting you can set in the, in the, the editor settings or the project settings. Um, so I know, you know, this probably means nothing to some of you. To some of you, you're probably very excited by this change, um, but, uh, but that is what Expanse does now for serializing presets.
Update number six has to do with modeling cloud density fields. Um, and it was kind of inspired by me looking at a lot of different reference photos and trying to uh, update the cloud modeling tutorial that's on the documentation page. Uh, in particular, you know, I would look up something like cumulus clouds um, and I would look at the clouds and I sort of noticed that oftentimes like the bottoms of the clouds are 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 darker and a little bit wispier than the top of the clouds, which look you know a lot more solid and dense. Um, and and this isn't always the case, but but frequently there's just sort of these differences in in the density and in the shape of the cloud over the the height of the of the the sort of cloud volume. Another example of this is anvil clouds. Um, you know they have these really really dense cumulus cumulonimbus structures down here but then up here they get really uh you know really thin optically thin um because the the water crystals the water crystallizes into ice and spreads out um and so it, it started to become clear that you know if you're ever really going to be able to author huge cumulonimbus clouds like this or even just really convincing cumulus clouds uh with expanse you're going to need some way to be able to adjust the density and the shape of the cloud over the height and the best way to do that, I thought, was to use animation curves to be able to change the density and the coverage over the, uh, the, the height of the cloud volume. So to give you a sense of what this looks like, if we open up the density animation curve and we drag this over here, you'll see that the, the density is, is now high at the bottom of the cloud. And if we drag it to the right, then you can see that the density is lower for longer. Um, and, and you can just sort of mess around with this and, and get different results. Um, I think it looks best when you sort of have it a, a sharp fall off that starts a little ways up. That way you get the wispy bottoms, um, but and then and then transition to the denser tops. Um, and similar, similarly, you can do this with the coverage uh, to change the shape of the clouds. Um, so if we bump this up, then they're not quite so rounded at the top. They're taller. If we bump this control point down, they round more, and you can sort of change the the spline parameters to get different uh, different looking shapes. Um, in particular, this is really good for uh, for for cumulonimbus clouds and and like I said, anvil structures. If we load something that looks like that, um, you can see here that we have very dense clouds down here and very thin clouds up here. But yeah, you can notice up here that we have sort of this this dense cumulus looking thing down here and then up at the top we have these really wispy uh, anvil shapes happening um, and that is due to this density curve here which starts out very dense and then gets very very thin and this coverage curve which pulls the coverage in around the middle of the cloud volume um, and you can see that we can change that here and it's pretty easy to just make little tweaks that doesn't look so good well, maybe you think it looks good. I don't think it looks that great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we can do stuff like that. Update number seven and, and kind of the elephant in the room with Expanse 1.5, the, the really big change is that Expanse uses a new lighting model for clouds. Um, the previous lighting model was based on the work that Andrew Schneider did for Horizon Zero Dawn. And that model is really fantastic. And, and it, it sort of pioneered real-time volumetrics, uh, volumetric multiple scattering in a way that uh, was pretty genius and, and I admire his work a lot. Um, but I was noticing that it was kind of falling short in a couple of different places and in particular um, the, the thing that it really has trouble modeling is these sort of dark edges around clouds um, uh, when they become particularly dense. Um, and this is something that a lot of current volumetric cloud systems struggle to model. If, if you look up Unreal Engine's clouds um, you can see uh, that they they generally look pretty good, but they they don't really have those those dark edges around the clouds. Um, they they still sort of look kind of uh, just very very foggy, very flat. They don't have that uh, distinct kind of you know what Andrew Schneider refers to as the powdered sugar effect. Um, uh, and and even Andrew Snyder's clouds, which look great, they they don't uh, they don't they don't model it exactly uh, in a way that's quite as salient as as is is noticeable on on real uh, on real clouds. Um, and so you know, I, I did some thinking about 
ways to possibly model this. And the goal with 1.5's lighting model was that it would have a couple of parameters that you could tweak, but generally would just work. And you wouldn't have to tweak very much beyond what you would have to specify to something like a path tracer to render clouds in a way that you want to. Um, so with that said, there's sort of three sections. And one of those sections is the base lighting section. And technically, if you were rendering with a path tracer, if you were rendering with a perfect renderer, this, these are the only parameters you would need. So, you know, I tried to keep this as simple as possible, but you have your density, which controls how, uh, how dense the clouds are, right? You can keep that pretty low, or if you increase it, then they get more defined shapes. Um, uh, you have anisotropy, which tells you um, how directional the scattering is, and and then you have some parameters around around ambient light and how much ambient light you want to you want the clouds to receive. Um, the other two sections are pretty much uh, approximation sections. They're 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 self shadowing and multiple scattering. They're they're both uh, sections that have parameters where you can sort of tweak how expanses. Uh, approximation to the real physical rendering algorithm uh, is 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 working and 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 sort of override them in an artistic fashion um, as such I tried to keep the number of parameters in each of these sections relatively low um, so uh, this self shadowing section um, there's a bunch of parameters here that the ones really the only ones that you need to care about um, uh, are are the self shadowing checkbox if you disable that then all self-shadowing effects will go away, and if you if you re-enable it, then <laughs> then they're back. Um, and then shadow persistence is the other one to care about here, and this is basically just how intense the shadows are that the clouds cast on themselves. Um, if it's higher, they're darker. If it's lower, they're brighter. And then the other foldout here uh, is the multiple scattering foldout, uh, and this basically controls uh, how much light scatters around in the cloud. Uh, that is coming from secondary, tertiary, you know, bounces that happen uh, at multiple orders of scattering. Um, that again, usually, you know, this would just happen in a path tracer. Your renderer, you wouldn't need to tweak anything; it would just look right. Uh, but I have some artistic overrides here uh, so that you can sort of control how you want it to look and how the approximation that Expanse uses works. Um, there's this receptive field parameter. That's the one you really are going to be tweaking most of the time. And it just tells you how much multiple scattering there is. Um, you know, I think that that looks pretty good. Um, and then the other one to, to keep in mind here is is under this allow non-physical section. And it's the bias. And this will sort of help you, if you increase it, it'll reduce how gray certain spots are and it'll brighten the clouds in certain areas um, so I think that looks pretty good right there but you know you can play around and, and see what you think okay well there you have it seven new features in Expanse 1.5 that I'm really excited about and I wanted to show you guys um, if you use 1.5 and you really like it that's awesome stop by our discord and talk to everybody about it and if you really hate it or something is going wrong also stop by our discord and and let me know because i want to fix the problems uh, with it it's a big update there might be some instability for a little while but soon enough we'll have all that hammered out i'll pop a link down in the description for our discord channel uh, you can come and check it out if you feel like it um, but anyway i will say for now thanks for watching and i hope you have a great day